Right, well, welcome back after coffee. Um, uh, two good presentations uh, to start with. And um, it's now my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Ian Hudson, who's uh, the C Chief Executive of the MHRA. Uh, before that, Ian uh, was a paediatrician, trained as a paediatrician, and worked for 11 years in the pharmaceutical industry before joining the MHRA in 2001. So uh, I know I'm looking forward to talking to Ian. I've got a list of questions to start with, and Ian's allowed to ask me questions too, if he, if he wants to. Um, and uh, we'll take it from there. And I will also allow some time at the end to take some, some of your questions too, because I'm sure you've got uh, potential questions for Ian. Now, when I invited Ian uh, to come and do this, I think it was back in January, February, we were expecting uh, that by then we'd know what was going on with Brexit, and in particular the medicines regulations. Unfortunately, as you all know, it hasn't quite worked out like that. So um, we were going to spend quite a lot of time talking about Brexit, but uh, I think given that there's not much to talk about, because we haven't know what's going on, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be talking about other things, but we will touch on Brexit um, at some time. So, so welcome in. Um, as I said, we've... Uh, you know, we agree to have a chat about uh, lots of things. So um, now, perhaps if I, I just open with a question. You've been the chief executive now of, of the MHRA for just over five years, and your, your role encompasses not only medicines regulations, uh, but also devices, um, the clinical practice research database, and the national standards, the biological standards. So that's, that's you know, it's, it's clearly a, a big job very diverse. Most people think you just do medicines, but clearly you don't. Um, what, can I ask what do you enjoy about your role most, and what are your main challenges, Brexit apart, of course? So. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this session today. Uh, as, as you've mentioned, the agency actually is big and it's diverse with the different parts to it, and I think that's uh, part of the... Uh, aspects of the of my work that I enjoy most, the sheer diversity of it. So one moment I might be dealing with something within the clinical practice research data link and the future there in terms of what we can do in interventional trials as well as the observational side of things. Next minute it might be uh, an issue at NIBS where we are take, developing standards for things like Zika or Ebola or something like that. Uh, and then all the regulatory challenges. So the, the real enjoyment, if you like, comes from the diversity. It comes from all the new work that's coming through, all the new science being developed, the, the feeling that within the agency we can really make an impact on, um, on, on public health. What are the challenges? Well, um, Brexit of course, but we're going to park that for a few minutes at least before we get to that. Um, uh, operationally we're changing all our IT systems, etc., and that sort of thing. Uh, but but, but I, I think the, the biggest challenge facing us all as regulators around the world is how are we going to deal with all the new technologies and, and, and the new products that are coming along? How are we going to um, be able to work together much more? None of us will be able to do absolutely everything for everyone, so we need to collaborate much more. Um, we're in a society where, where healthcare is changing rapidly, so how will our role evolve in relation to working with our partners, um, patient involvement, expectations of transparency. These are the big issues that I think we and indeed all regulators face uh, around the world. So some of these are some of the big uh, issues that we face, as well as the Brexit. The B, the B word. The B yes, word. Yeah. that's it. Okay. Now, I, I think you're the first CEO, correct me if I'm wrong, to have actually worked in industry um, um, first, and effectively a poacher term gamekeeper, if you'll excuse that. But, and, and of course, being a practicing paediatrician. Um, so how's that helped you, really, in your role? And, and do you think it's given you a, a different perspective, having you know, developed medicines, worked as a clinician like that, uh, from your predecessors? And how's that affected how you have approached your job? Well, my, my two predecessors would be Keith Jones and Kent Woods, and Keith actually came from Merck, so he, he did, I think he did clinical yeah. pharmacology in Merck, so he did in fact work in industry, and he was uh, MCA, he recruited me into the MCA, he wasn't 
MHRA when we merged with devices. And then uh, uh, Kent came from um, uh, academia, etc. Um, what I feel it, it's been helpful for me is because I've had a, a fairly diverse career, as you say, working in the NHS, working in the university, working in industry and in different aspects of industry, and now the um, uh, regulator, is it, it's given me the breadth of experience, if you like, uh, particularly the industry bit as we regulate uh, industry to really understand some of the issues that industry faces and perhaps the other way around when industry says certain things you think well yes okay but you know I've been there I kind of understand the truth or not of that shall we say. Uh, so it, for me it's brought that breadth of experience that I can bring to the challenges that we face. I understand some of the challenges of drug development or products in the marketplace uh, and um, I, I think it it helps me. Also, the agency has shifted a long way culturally as well over the time I've been there to be much more open, much more approachable. People may not like the decisions we make sometimes, of course, that's our job, but everyone deserves a good service and we want to be as open as possible and having been on the other end working with perhaps what was then a long time ago, a relatively cold and distant regulatory system to be much more open and much more uh, come and talk to us type of thing. Yes, yeah. And uh, really as a follow-on, I've, you know, over the years I've noticed uh, particularly pharmaceutical physicians go into the agency for a while yes. and, and come out. Um, do you think that's an advantage as well? So, I mean, people often ask me, where should I go next, you know, in my career? Yes. Do you think that's, you know, a good idea to, to get that experience inside and then come out again? And, Vice versa. Yes, I do. I think uh, um, clearly drug development is a specialist area. Of course, the faculty uh, represents that. Um, and I don't, I think it's very difficult to get that sort of experience unless you're either working in industry or you see it from a regulatory point of view. Now, of course, we get people coming into the agency from academia, from various aspects of clinical practice, um, but then they go through a, a learning curve in terms of what it's all about. That um, the companies are doing and, and, and what we do, um, but bringing that experience with you, I think, is is very important. Also, I think it probably helps people go back into industry um, when they've had experience of the regulator to perhaps understand a little bit more where the regulator is coming from. It's always patient and the public first. It's never the shareholders. It's always what is the right thing for patients and the public above everything else. And you know, when you, when it's a sort of balance caution or it's probably all right sort of thing, you, 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 you get a better sense of where regulators would come from on that. Um, I think the other thing that working in an agency does is we, we see everything. You know, we deal yes. with, yeah. um, uh, it may be a startup company one minute, it may be the GSKs, the Pfizer's of the world the next minute, it may be a parallel import one minute, it may be, I, I don't know, some blood product or something the, the next. It's very, very broad experience and you get that very quickly working, I think, within the uh, agency. Yeah. See all sorts of companies, all sorts of approaches, all sorts of products. Yes, and of course, you you know the medics there at the MHRA do the do do the PMST program because I know it's it's part of your training. I think you're certainly in the top five with the number of people that you're putting through the training program. You know, yes, so, we, so. we've got about seventy or so medics, seventy eighty medics or something like that within yeah. the agency and. Certainly, we're very keen to encourage our physicians to go through higher training in mm. pharmaceutical medicine. Uh, many of them have come from a background where maybe they've, they've already done cardiology or respiratory medicine or, or, or whatever and uh, got to a specialist level there. But we're still very keen to support them going through that as well. Yes, yeah. yes. So we've got a number of people going through the program at any one time. Mm. Yes. And now, just changing the subject slightly, you've also worked inside the MA. Yes. Um, you were chair, vice chair of the CHMP yep. uh, a while ago. Um, you currently sit on the management board of the MEA. Um, how does the working within the MHRA and the MEA differ from what yes. you, you, know, you can say? And have you actually brought different skills and approaches, clearly working at the MA level, uh, compared with the MHRA? <laughs> Any well, comments well, on that with, with what well, you can <laughs> say? You know? they're, they're quite different in a way. I mean, working within at CHMP is very much about um, it, it, it's the making sure quality, safety, efficacy of the products, the risk benefit is fine, that sort of thing. But uh, but from a people point of view, it's very much working with people 
from other countries, the, the experts from the other countries, and you each put forward your arguments uh, and try to persuade people if there's a divergent view, etc. So it's very much that aspect. Um, it's not a hierarchical system that one might expect in, in a, uh, an agency where you are the line manager or CEO or whatever it is. Um, but it, it is one that's much more persuading people. Um, CHMP uh, is a very reward, has been for me, a, was a very rewarding experience in terms of seeing the breadth of products come through and being able to help from the regulatory point of view the right ones get through, help them being developed properly, uh, get licensed properly so they're used properly. So you can see the, the, the ultimate benefits uh, to public health that emerge from that. And in, you know, in my career we've seen HIV turn from being something you die from to something you live with. You see uh, all the biological medicines really fundamentally changing the, the, the autoimmune diseases. There's been some huge advances over that and to have seen some of that and supported some of that and helped tie it in the right direction I think has been an enormous privilege. The, the, the management board is really quite different and it's much more like the management board of many organisations. It's, it's, it's budgets, it's procedures, it's performance, it's, and of course now dominated largely through it with, with, with Brexit yes. preparedness of the EMA moving to uh, Amsterdam. But again, it's very much working with people from all the different uh, countries, yes. Mm, yeah. yeah. So, And on a different scale again, in a global scale, you're also currently a chair of the International Coalition yep. of the Medicines Regulatory Authority, so that brings together everybody, doesn't it, really, at, at that level. Um, um, so is it a bit like the United Nations and uh, what sort of things do you discuss and do you fall out you know and uh, refuse to vote like the Russians and things like that? No, 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 <laughs> nothing like that at all, no, 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 no. we don't sort of expel members or anything no. like that, no, no, not, not like that. Um, ICMRA, International Coalition of Medicines Regulatory Authorities, brings together uh, over 20 of the main regulators around the world. So it includes Health Canada, the FDA, Mexico, Brazil, uh, several countries in Europe, um, South Africa, uh, India, China there, Japan's there, Australia, New Zealand, Korea, and probably a number of others that I'm forgetting to mention right now. So it really brings many of the key regulators around the world together and it brings them together at, the, at a more strategic level, the heads of the agencies. And the intent behind that was really to f form a forum, not to pr reproduce what ICDRA, the WHO yes. meeting does, or ICH or anything else does, but bring the heads together to collectively work on some of the strategic challenges we all face within the uh, regulatory world. Uh, and if we as heads can't make a difference, then uh, who can, if you like? And it's to really to put our collective minds together and then leverage other uh, organizations to, to, to take forward. Um, the sorts of areas that we work on, there are four strategic priorities. One is innovation and we've been doing some work here on horizon scanning, what's new, what's coming along, novel regulatory pathways that we might share and, and think about in our own uh, regions to adapt to, to, to be used for some of the new things coming along. We've been doing some work in the pharmacovigilance area uh, how big data might be used to support spontaneous reporting systems and rapid analysis of signals, etc. Um, how to encourage and learn from each other in terms of encouraging adverse event reporting, that sort of thing. We've been doing some work in terms of how we work together as an international regulatory community to respond to crisis. So uh, the next Ebola or Zika or whatever it is, or Marburg or something like that, how can we work together as an international community to respond to that in a consistent way with clear messages rapidly and supporting, help facilitating um, uh, appropriate uh, responses within our sphere. Um, also in the um, uh, supply chain area, there's two areas there I think we, we've been working. One is a uh, very specific one which is track and trace, uh, what, what are the best characteristics characteristics of a track and trace system such that future systems can talk to each other, they're all aligned so we can get more towards a global approach. The, the other area we've been working on is GMP inspections, mutual reliance. So we've had picks for many years and coming up with standards and that's great. But what we were finding is, well fine we've got common standards but we still 
duplicating effort, if you like, and uh, if, you, if you know, a manufacturer would say, well, this year I've had 50 different inspections from different authorities around the world. And what can we do to do more to create a framework where we can rely on each other's inspections? It's still a national decision whether MHRA goes to inspect a site in India or Australia or wherever it is. But if we can do that, knowing the FDA have been there, knowing Health Canada have been there, knowing Australia's there, and we can see what they've found, we can then take a decision in terms of um, do we need to go, do we want to go, it's a, perhaps a lower priority because we know other regulators have been there and it's all fine, we'll put our resources somewhere else. So we've come up with a framework for that, and then we've handed it on to PICS to say, go make it operational, if you like, well, not quite go make it yes. operational, but, but could we work together to, to actually put it into practice? And that's the sort of thing where we recognise the problem, we work through what we might be able to do about it, and we're leveraging another group to take it forward. So that's the sort of thing we've been yes, doing. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, one area that um, you know, is a big problem is counterfeit drugs. Yes. Because clearly, I think, uh, organised crime now make more money from counterfeit drugs than they yes. do from the illegal ones. Is that the sort of thing that you'd be dealing with and talking about? We, 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 we have discussions about, I mean, I think one of the key things for ICMOR is where can we make a difference that other groups aren't doing? And certainly, um, we recognise this as a huge importance, uh, hugely important. We also reflect on what else is happening in this uh, space, so all the enforcement officers get together through various uh, venues. We've also just had Operation Pangaea, uh, again, just in the last uh, week or so, where there's a concerted action by over 100 countries and authorities around the world uh, to take a specific week, week of action to deal with internet sales. Uh, just in the UK, we took down, what, 150-odd sites, recovered a million doses of medicines, that sort of thing, including, and also some devices, counterfeit devices as well as part of that. So there are already mechanisms, Operation Pangea through Interpol, but there are already mechanisms of um, work in this area. Um, so we, 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 ICMA itself isn't, hasn't got any particular project on that, but we are talking to people about where we think we as heads can add most value on top of all the other initiatives that are going on. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, let's, let's look at the future and talk a bit about innovation. Yep. You've been at the agency you know, a number of years now, and so you'll have witnessed the change, like most of us have been yep. around, from yep. you know, antibodies coming in, advanced therapies, and, and, and the use of you know, immunotherapy, etc. And, and looking to the future, you know, we've got CRISPR technology coming yep. along. Um, how, do, as the agency, how do you manage to keep up to date with those developments? I mean, I struggle and I'm developing some of those. So, um, you know, how do you, how do you go about that to make sure that what comes to you, you're aware of? And, yep. um, I mean, also, you know, I, I took a company this week with a totally different sort of treatment paradigm. Um, yet we got very good feedback from the agency. Um, nobody's ever done this before. It's an neonatal indication. Um, so how do you manage to keep up to date? Because clearly the company I took knew all about it, but you know, we, we, uh, with, the, with the regulators on the regulator side. How do, you how do you manage that? Well, I'm glad you said you got very good feedback, because yeah, that was sorry. going to be my question it's, yes, to the, you. Yes, the check's <laughs> in the post, don't yes, worry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're very fortunate to have a, a, a big agency, 1,300 of us, um, and so we've got a lot of in-house expertise, uh, and we talked about some of these biological areas. We've yeah. got some 300 odd or so biological scientists at NIBS working on all sorts of uh, areas very relevant to, to, to this. So the sort of quality and, and the mechanistic stuff and the risks and et cetera, that there's a lot of expertise there. We also have the advantage of an extensive advisory committee structure where we can bring in external experts. We've got over 200 uh, experts we can call upon to, uh, um, the, uh, um, from academia to, to help us uh, for areas that we don't have sufficient expertise. Uh, so we have that, and that's continually refreshed in terms of if we can't find someone, well, then we will go and find someone to, who's got particular expertise to bring in to help us as necessary. In, in terms of approach to um, novel products coming along. We also uh, have instigated a horizon scanning function within the agency where we look to see what's coming along over the horizon from whether it's new publications, um, whether it's early scientific advice, whether it's stuff going through our innovation office, 
uh, whether it's wherever it is, a whole range of different signals, and we get together and sort of re reflect on what's coming through, and then think about do we need to um, have particular expertise in that area? And sometimes, for example, at NIBS, we've put in place some PhD studentships right. to in, in e emerging areas, uh, so that we know they're going to be coming in due course to us, and, and let's let's get ourselves prepared. So we have a variety of different mechanisms for keeping ourselves up to date and about a variety of different tools, if you like, for dealing with them. As well. Yes, yeah. I mean, and likewise, the, the regulatory approach has also changed, yes. hasn't it, as we've gone. Yes. And clearly the emphasis now, and I know, you know there's government pressure to get medicines to market as soon as we can. Um, and so, you know, we've got the initiatives like Prime at the European level, um, early access to medicines, accelerated access review. Um, really, have you any comments on these initiatives? And do we know they're working yet? You know, I mean, it's, it's maybe too early to say that, but you know, with some of these very recently come in, and sort of what's your approach or views on on these early access schemes? Because clearly the risk might go up, won't it? Yes. In approving that. That's right. I, mean, I, I think again, what's happened over the years, we've gone from a um, a fixed time point. It's all pre-licensure. It's all post-licensure, and it's fundamentally different to a range of tools that are available to companies, to regulators, to have a much more flexible and measured approach uh, to making products available. And they go from, in the UK context, it's, it's things like we've got the earlier access to medicine scheme. So. Um, with the PIM designation, the first part, but the, the, the opinion on unlicensed use, which allows um, the products to be uh, made available in the UK before they're authorised. We've had 20 opinions through the EAMS scheme, for example. We've got conditional approvals in the European setting. We've got licensing under exceptional circumstances. We've got licensing with conditions. Accelerated access approach was start with a narrow indication in a high risk area where perhaps the uncertainties are justified by the lack of alternatives, etc. Start in a, 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 a narrow area uh, and then expand. So I think it's right that given that we're in a, a, an area where we've gone from sort of single blockbusters to a range of different medicines, range of different conditions, we've got a range of tools to deal with them. And I, and I think um, um, clearly we if you, if you license some, you, you need to pick a point when you like to agree to expand the use of a product into the marketplace. Um, at that point, a certain amount will be known. Clearly, if you go earlier in the time frame, you will know less and the risks will be that much higher. So you've always got to balance that against the circumstances, the degree of unmet, uh, unmet medical need, um, the alternatives, the seriousness of the condition, all of that side of things. Uh, but it's also coupled with you absolutely must strengthen the vigilance in case safety issues do emerge in the marketplace. Uh, you can deal with them very rapidly uh, and take appropriate action to avoid further harm uh, if, if at all possible. So strengthening vigilance, toolbox there, I think these things are absolutely what we need to be doing in a very flexible approach. Yes. Um, and of course, the other thing, and we were talking about it in the first two sessions, is real world data. Yes. You know, and you know, we've touched on it already this morning about the Salford Lung Study being the first study that's, you know, huge study, real world data that's actually been used now to support an approval. Um, is this really the taste of things to come? And I already asked a question earlier about how the regulators keeping up with this and what you're going to do about it. It's, it's a paradigm shift, isn't it, with what we're doing? Well, where it's going. real world data will clearly have its role. We've been using real world data in the post marketing yeah. space for many years. Uh, and if you think about a large adverse event databases, yes. the yellow card uh, database, etc., that's real world data. If you think about CPRD and doing pharmacoepidemiological mm -hmm. studies, looking at whatever it is, refuting the link between MMR and autism, safety of pertussis vaccine in pregnancy, safety of statins in the marketplace, that yes. sort of study that's been done on the CPRD, that's all real world mm -hmm. data. We've been using, uh, to some extent, some real world data to support pre authorization extrapolation. Um, so real world data will clearly have a role. Now, if you're getting into pre marketing area, yes. But, um, and, and the but here is clearly if you're developing a novel immunological agent that's targeted some new target, 
high risk area, we'll all remember TGM 1412, etc. You're not going to put that in a real world setting on day one, no, clearly. Quite, yes. uh, and you're going to do that in a very, very tightly controlled environment, and bit by bit you'll relax it. What you, but, but on the other hand, at some point you've got to get to medicines and the data that's generated is relevant to the broader population. So it's really defining along there um, uh, where you, what's appropriate and what isn't appropriate to generate the data. Uh, so it's very much a consideration of that. Now, I, I think my, my colleagues within the agency probably, were there, but I think their experience with things like Prime and adaptive licensing was there was an opportunity there to explore more real-world data used to perhaps expand indications, etc. And I think in a way they felt a little disappointed that there weren't more offers from industry, right. if you That's like, interesting. Yeah. That, to come along and, and uh, say, well, okay, we've done randomized controlled trials so far, now can we explore real-world data to support going more, going further? And there wasn't as much of that as I think the opportunity was there. And there is, I think, maybe it's a question back to you and, and yes. the, the audience about a certain conservatism of industry. Now, nobody wants the risk of turning up with something and us saying, go away, that's ridiculous, you should never have done that in yeah. the first place, you've wasted a year, etc. No one wants that. But, but let's explore together the opportunities that might be there um, that will satisfy our needs and and start to use this data and, and yes. address your yeah. needs. That, that's very interesting because I, I said because I, I know you you weren't here first thing, but um, yeah, the last two years I've been out and asked many times to defend real uh, sorry randomised control trials. Are they yep. still the gold standard? Yep. So it sounds like there's an opportunity and it's, uh, perhaps there's a symposium there we could perhaps set up between us or something like that. I still think randomised control trials are a gold standard. Yes. I don't think real-world data is going to replace no. that, but it will have a role, I mean, if nothing else, the feasibility of randomised control trials, but also as you get further on, you're safer in terms of this, you know more about the safety yeah. profile of a drug, there's less risk and all of that. Uh, there are opportunities there to be supplementing the, that, that, those... Yes, yeah. yeah. And where do you think patients come into all this? Because I know we're doing clinical trials, but <laughs> we are encouraged to consult with patient groups. Yes. And, and yeah. I, I've been impressed going along to you know, a lot of scientific advice meetings recently where they've actually got patients there mm. um, who are listening in and then they get asked uh, questions. I've, I've had a good one recently, actually. Can't name the product, but there were two patients there the end of the scientific advice, the chairman turned to these two patients and said, what do you think? And they both said, this is great, we need it. You yes. know? So wh where, does, where do patients coming in at the MHRA? You know? I, I, I'll, I'll answer that in a moment. Yeah. I'll just say my, my own experience of working with patients actually has been very positive. And I remember my first experience of working with patients, with patient groups, apart from when I was in clinical practice, yeah. putting up, when, when I was a regulator, was an HIV product where we thought, well, if we ask patients, they're bound to say, of course they want it, and it was a bit mm, touch and go. And actually, we did consult with patient groups at the time, and they said, well, this is meaningless to us. And actually, that was very helpful, and it really opened my eyes. Mm. That was my very first experience in many, many years ago of doing that. And uh, um, of course, every now and then, whoever you consult, you maybe have a, a, another agenda. But my, my, my experience has been very, very positive. They add a lot of value. Um, and it, it's important, don't just get one person's view and assume that it extrapolates to, to, to everything. And for example, protective disease like multiple sclerosis, what patients will ask for and tolerate earlier on in the disease might be very different to what they will ask for uh, or hope for late on in the disease, for example, yes. and the risks they're prepared to take. So it, it, it really varies in the circumstances. Now, what is the agency doing? I, I think we all recognize the huge importance of more involvement from patients. And indeed, um, uh, every year I have uh, a meeting where we go to our ministers and annual accountability meeting with our ministers and uh, indeed that's one of the points he, he was asking us to, to, to make sure that we do more of in terms of working with patients. But in practice what are we doing? We've, we've opened up our board meetings to the public. So um, we usually get some patient representatives there and indeed they ask questions of us uh, and it's very important we are accountable to patients and the public. Um, we have meetings with stakeholder groups, uh, for example, if there's a particular issue with a product um, we, and, and there's a particular 
a charity or patient group that represents them, they'll come and want to talk to us and very happy to do that. Um, we've got a patient consultative group uh, within the agency uh, as well that we meet regularly and we take their advice more collectively on what we're doing and approaches to information, etc. Uh, we have lay members of our advisory committees uh, as well to try and bring a broader perspective on what we do. So a lot of things going on uh, in this area, but more inevitably that we should be doing and very much want to yes. do more in yeah. this area. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry to do this to you now, but it is Brexit time. Oh. <laughs> um, um, it's a difficult area because yes. we don't know what's going on. There's a lot of debate. Um, you've had the consultation out yeah. uh, recently, which finished yesterday. Yeah. Um, I, know we, I responded on behalf of the Academy of Royal Medical Colleges about the legislation you might put in place in the case of a no yep. deal. Um, yep. So, and that was quite comprehensive and very useful to see. And I know many people in the room have responded uh, to that as well. But what what can you say at all about <laughs> Brexit at the moment? Probably not a well, lot, actually. We, we, we shouldn't preparing. lose we shouldn't lose sight first and foremost of the government's preferred position. Uh, it's articulated a number of times yes. of wanting to negotiate a continued collaboration with the European system. That's been made clear from very early days when two Secretary of States wrote yes. a letter to the Financial Times laid that out, Jeremy yes. Hunt and Greg Clark. Um, so that still remains the preferred outcome, continued collaboration in a meaningful way where the UK contributes to CHMP or the devices regime can lead work, etc., etc. Clearly the government must be prepared for a range of different scenarios. Uh, which may include a no deal come the 30th of March next year and a lot of work is going on in terms of preparation for that and you've seen the technical notices that were issued early in the year and the consultation that you've just uh, referred to as well and that's very much preparing for a no deal but we shouldn't lose sight of the preferred outcome is a, continu is yes. a continued uh, working relationship with the European Union. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. and I think as you know most of us are supporting you in that certainly I commented on it was in front of the Health Select Committee and yes. other people have, have done that. So I suppose fingers crossed that things come out the right way and we don't know yet when that's yeah. going to happen. No, we? no, the agency is working with other bits of government yes. clearly with the SIs you've seen them all yeah. but we're also working with, with um, Department of Health, with Office of Life Sciences, with Bayes etc and, and uh, really to coordinate a position. Yes. yes. Thank you. Well, in the last few minutes, I'll, I'll open up for questions. So, uh, any questions for you? Here come the microphones. We're down at the front here. Do you want to go? In the third row, do you want to go first? Okay, there. Thank you very much for that. Um, Vinay Petro, I've got a question about um, the recent judicial review to do with, that was brought by Navarro and Bayer, I believe, and an interesting part of the judgment where they sided with the CCGs was that the MHRA and regulators don't have the explicit, or, the, or sort of say, the unique ability to decide on risk and benefit, and perhaps CCGs and other groups do have a role in that as well, so I'm just keen to get your thoughts on that. Well, the judgment has come out, as you say, we're studying it very carefully. We are, of course, part of the Department of Health and the government, etc. We are considering next steps. Uh, they, it's up to the companies to decide if they are going to appeal. I guess there may well be an appeal, that's for, for the companies and the, judicial, uh, the judiciary to decide. Um, clearly, if there is an appeal, then elements may or may not get overturned from that. If they don't, the standing law is what the judgment uh, is, uh, and we'll have to follow it. But I think in the event of an appeal, we'll have to think very carefully uh, in terms of uh, where we stand in all of this. We being not just the agency, but the more collective Department of Health, Government, Secretary of State, because we all act on behalf of the Secretary of State, who is also responsible for the health service. So it is a, a very difficult issue. Um, there's the immediate impact on Avastin, but there's also the implications more broadly. Uh, but I think we need to see if there's an appeal and what the outcome of that is. We are studying the judgment, talking to people across the Department of Health and, and lawyers, etc., in terms of our position now. Okay, thank you. Gillis. Hi, Gillis. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, uh, Ian, I wondered whether the use of real world data might be an uh, area we could uh, use to um, generate signals on safety, and <laughs> because you can get bigger samples clearly. And the win for industry might be that we could re reduce the sample sizes on the efficacy studies, because the FDA endpoints tend to require fewer patients than uh, to demonstrate them than the rarer side effects. That could be an area where there could be a win-win. Yes, um, and, and indeed we're doing some work within the agency linking between the pharmacovigilance functions and CPRD and what can we do in CPRD. And I think the, the, the future will also be considering things like artificial intelligence and, and, and mining through uh, real-world data sets to produce signals, etc. You also have to address the issue of using the same data sets to identify signals and confirmation. And traditionally, we've taken a signal and wanted a different set of data to be able to confirm that that is a genuine signal and to try to um, work out how, because clearly there's always risk of false signals coming, coming through this and how you actually confirm it. But absolutely, and, and I think as we were discussing earlier, that the stronger you make the vigilance function and how quickly you can respond will inevitably affect size of a development program and when you prepare to say, well, there's enough data to make this more widely available. So if potentially you can instantly identify something because the data is there and take action immediately, then perhaps you're more prepared to um, accept an earlier time point. I absolutely take that. Yeah. Other questions? Alistair. Um, slightly different question, a bit more personal, Ian, if I may. Um, You've had a very varied career yep. um, in industry and in the MHA. If there's one thing you'd have done differently, what would that have been? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure. I, 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 I tend not to look back and think what would I have done differently so much as uh, to where, where are things going now and, and, and uh, uh, how to go forward. I've enjoyed all aspects of my career. I, uh, I guess like many people in this room, when I started off, I would have never predicted this career path. I've never been one to say, right, in five years' time, I'm doing this, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing this. But I've, I've enjoyed all, all the bit different uh, parts of my career. Um, I suppose I've always felt motivated to be doing the right thing in the health area sort of thing, and, and, and that's driven me, if you like. But I don't think I would have done anything differently. Yeah. One last question. Thank you. It's uh, Louise, Director of Endomedics. Um, just a quick question. What, what would be the best bit of advice you would give a first into industry physician, do you think, through your experience? Get plenty of experience. Don't be shy of putting yourself forward. Be prepared to go and explore all sorts of opportunities. Um, think about working in a regulatory agency. You get fantastic experience. <laughs> uh, MHRA website will include all our vacancies. Uh, come and join us. Uh, but go for the experience. Get the breadth of experience and go for the opportunities. And don't be shy. And you know, unless you try, you don't know. So go for it. Try it. Good. So, anyway, on that note, thank you very much, Ian. Uh, just to add, whatever comes out from Brexit, we're here to help. Thank you, very much. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>